Welcome to the Talk and Chatter Experience, powered by Gasoline Alley Harley Davidson, Philly Motorcycle Tires Australia, and TCX Boots. My guest today is three times Australian Superbike champion, Wayne Maxwell. It was great to sit down with Wayne and have a chat in a completely unfiltered conversation. In a world full of political correctness, you always know where you stand with Wayne. He wears his heart on his sleeve and tells you exactly what he's thinking, which is great to see. With Wayne's plan to retire at the end of 2022, he leaves behind a legacy of three, potentially four Australian Superbike championships and an Ovali series where he's mentoring juniors coming through the ranks in very, very good hands. So I hope you all enjoy the conversation with Wayne. Hit subscribe to our YouTube if you're enjoying our content. We'll be back with another show real soon. Welcome, Wayne Maxwell. Oh, oh, hey, mate. Thanks for having me. Mate, I am absolutely stoked. Well done on your win on the weekend. Uh, must feel pretty good, yeah? Yeah, it feels unbelievable to, um, yeah, as I said, I've probably said it, you would have heard it, but to, um, you know, go to the track where we thought was, we look at the calendar at the start of the year and we sort of look at the races where we could potentially maximise and the ones where we might have to consolidate to win one where we thought we are going to consolidate. It's pretty special. Absolutely, mate. And lap records, you know, qualify on pole and win the races come away from the weekend. That's pretty damn pretty damn good, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And it was a right, right at a tipping point. Mike's momentum has it was, it's been strong. So, And we sort of knew that our backs were against the wall. We'd, we'd had a few things that um, were out of our control going on in, inside the garage. And to fight back like we did at, at uh, Morgan Park is, you know, it's a reward for the guys because they need, you know, they're all volunteers and they need the encouragement to uh, basically keep coming back. Who's Wayne Maxwell? <laughs> Who is he? Oh, he's a, <laughs> I don't know. I guess it's someone you could either lo- like love or hate. I've got a, you know, for most of the people I've uh, worked with over the years, you know, I've got really good relationships with from racing side. But um, you know, you, you have to you have to put on a front when it comes to racing. It's like a it's a it's a mind game. It's a it's a game of. Um, you know, you have to play. I don't play too much into many of them, but um, you know, if you're seen as a weak or a vulnerable person, people are. Yeah, people try to eat you up out there. Do you enjoy that side of it? Yeah, I do enjoy it. Yeah. I, the politics stuff I don't enjoy, but the the rivalry, yeah, I enjoy. Like, you know what I mean? And when someone's better than me, I'm the first person to. Um, you know, I like to congratulate them because without these people better than you, you're only against yourself. And if you win easy, like I really like the challenge. When yep. someone's better than me somewhere, I don't like it. So I work out a way to make, you know, become better myself. And and that, it's not so much niggle, but there's like always banter sort of thing. But I see it in like the podium. There's always handshakes and stuff. That must be a good feeling, yeah? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and like I'm close with some of the other guys. And when you see someone like, say, Troy with the adversity he's been through to... You know, I know how hard he worked before he was injured and how hard he's worked after. So I'm stoked for him to be able to see him back on the podium a few times to shake his hand. It's been uh, pretty good. Some of his moves, um, he's riding pretty damn good, eh? Like, yeah, yeah. Some of them pretty tough. Oh, always. He always, yep. even if he's not, he'll still put it on the line. That's yep. what I like about him. Yeah, and that's, yeah, absolutely. That's the thing you look for for all the riders. If everyone does that, you, you're in for a good class, eh? Yeah, I mean, it's not, um, I don't think it's your good days that define you. It's your bad days mm. when you're having a bad time. You know, and um, that's really been us. That's really been our team this year. You know, it's um, we've had a lot of bad days. You know, one race where we struggle, even though it looks like from the outside we've been pretty good, and then to come out and win the next one is um, yeah, that's that's a, good for us. Where do those bad days come from? Like, obviously, the last uh, twenty twenty and twenty one, two championships in a row. How do bad days creep in in twenty twenty two? Um, just competition. Some, no, well, not really. Things out of our control, like yep. you know, a bit of a uh, failure at Phillip Island, crashed out of the, crashed out of the lead. What was going to be a race, and then that set up. We had to build a new bike, and then we had some issues that were unusual with that bike, you know. So, and then that was Queensland gone, and yep. then we went to Darwin. Uh, sorry, we went to yeah, we went to Wakefield, and um, yeah, we had a few more issues, like little things go wrong there, new people in the team, stuff goes wrong. But you know, that's you can't sort of grow without that. And then um, yeah, Darwin had COVID, so what do you do? You just have to fight on through it and yep. go from there. It still looked good in Darwin. Like <laughs> uh, you see, like things like that starting line thing. What happened on the starting line on? That race. Oh, uh, the the clutch got hot. I had some worn some yep. worn bits, maybe that we'd missed and oversight and bits and pieces. And um, yeah, and then I couldn't find neutral, so I had the clutch in the whole time. It was really hot. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I was a bit flustered with some other stuff going on. Yeah. So fifty fifty. It's just uh, sometimes it uh, happens, but it's like yeah, that's what I said. It's it's how how we bounce back. Yeah. After that, and um, yeah, we honestly I haven't had a great feeling with the bike. For a few of the races and um the guys could see that i wasn't riding at my best so they asked me you know they're always apologetic and say yep. well you know it's not 
they never blame me. They always like, well, why? What's wrong with the bike? Because you're always pretty much perfect. They tell me. So. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know, hard to believe, right? Yeah. Mate. <laughs> um, with with like uh, obviously having mistakes, like uh, or well, something happened, like Phillip Island. This this is obviously an issue there. How do, how do you bounce back from that? Do you just do you, <laughs> are you someone that just forgives it and just gets straight back up and says whatever, let's get on? Well, I just look at it like I've been through there hundreds of times and only crashed once. So my yeah. first fly was um, a tenth off my fastest lap in the race one in second race Wow! off that. So, um, yeah, didn't think about it too much, mate. Straight on. And I hadn't really ridden that bike at all. So it was pretty um, – to go through there and just uh, tip it, go put it on the line. By that time, uh, it was funny because – Obviously, I'm thinking, I don't know what went on. Like, that was weird. I didn't do anything different. I struggled and then I just, you know, I was struggling a little bit with the feeling and then I crashed in the race. Yep. So that was really strange. And then um, just as I was putting my helmet on to get ready to go out as a two-minute siren, when I seen there was a massive fluster in the garage and I heard Craig say, what the fuck do you mean? Like, you know, and I was like, and then I seen him flustering around with the front tyre and then um, as I went to go out, he said, oh, we found the issue from race one. You'll be right. Uh, and then, so and then um so then yeah we went out and away we went wow yeah that's <laughs> yeah that's a tough one yeah. um where did it start for you mate uh, like you're a Wollongong kid originally so where did it start yeah well it started um I guess my dad was always into motorbikes Wollongong in that era um you know uh, when I was growing I was born in 1982 so um yeah October 1982 and. I guess uh, motorbikes were massive. Wayne Gardner won was a fir- on his world championship in '87. So like you know, they shut down the whole town. There's a ticket take parade, yeah. you know. And then in ten years, just under ten years later, Troy Corsa wins the world two bike championship. So in my time, my exposure, I've got two world champions that have come from the same hometown. Yeah. Um. So that part of it was pretty special. And yeah, as I said, my dad he had a motorbike shop, a small mechanical repair business. So. You know, like there was a lot of influential people that are around motorcycling that either helped, you know, your gardeners or, you know, all the other famous motorbike riders that came out of Wollongong. So, yeah, I guess it was just around. And, yeah, I played rugby league really until I was uh, 13 and then I was trying to do both and I was, like, quite good at rugby league. And then I was like, I don't know, I just wanted to race motorbikes. I don't even know, I don't even know how I came to the decision to do that because I gave away what was potentially a solid career in playing rugby league that could have been whatever yep. and um yeah just decided motorbikes for me do you think talented people can do like talented things like oh, that i can't juggle mate i, okay. can't, I, can't, I can't do backflips i can't do um it's I like a know. dedication thing probably yeah i guess a lot of it's a mind a, a mindset yep. and um yeah it's i don't know over times you think you look at people and you th- i see people on motorbikes go far out they got some talent mm. like some of the way the skill on the bike but i think one thing you can't create is hunger Mm. And I think the hunger comes from your upbringing. Yep. So I think, you know, depends on your demographic, if you come from money or no money and, you know, you've got to make every post a, a winner because you can't, you haven't got any money, you know, like yep. sort of thing. It's, it's a hard one. So I think um, the upbringing, that creates hunger. It's interesting because I was born in Buloi. Yeah. Right? And so I'm in Wollongong. Yeah. Um, Love motorbikes my whole life but didn't win three Australian championships like you. Like had the influences around, obviously, like Wayne Gardner, Troy Corser and that from your hometown but never won a championship in it. You know what I mean? And it probably does come to obviously hunger and yeah. dedication. You obviously dedicated, you know, your life to this. Yeah, I mean, I had a few ups and downs. It, it, it actually, like I got my first factory Subai contract when I was 18. Wow. So like, that's like, you know, I was lucky. So in my time, um, I started racing dirt bikes and stuff and I was like, you know, okay. I was probably wasn't a really, I wouldn't say I was in a tough age group, like I was in an easy age group for the dirt track title, say, and then a tough for the long track because my age yep. was in between. Normally they split over those months. So, um, you know, I wouldn't say that part. But uh, also in that time, I got to – there was the first time juniors started road racing in Australia and that was on Morawaki 80. So that was in 97, I think, was our first race. Wow. So, um, look, it was, uh, it was I was just about timing really and Premal Honda – that was a, the Honda dealership in Wollongong where we're from. They were friends with Tony Hatton who started the series. Yep. And um, yeah, they basically put the money up for me to buy the bike because we couldn't afford it. Yep. And then, um, yeah, I just grew over those two years and that was it. My dad had a, my dad and mum made a massive commitment and um, yeah, to, to have that backing is, you know, have the blessing of your family and stuff is, um, and see my brothers and sisters go without, I guess that's why you got mm. no choice but to try to win. Yeah, you've got to, hey. Yeah. Is the Moroaki 80 at that time, that was running along with like Australian Superbike Championship, wasn't it? That's yeah, I started off like we started, there was a, there was one or two races and we used to do some races on the, like at Eastern Creek on the Saturday night when they were say at the, at the big circuit and yep. stuff at Eastern Creek. Um, but we used to, 
we also raced at you know Wakefield Park and some other Oran Park when it was like the figure oh. eight part, so the small smaller yep. part of the circuit. So yeah, got exposed to a lot of you know a lot of different things, and you know in my time there. I guess Westy was just older than us, and then you had Vermeulen, Brock Parks, you know Josh Brooks, Alex Gobert, Damien Cardlin. Him and I were a day age apart. Craig Coxall, like there was a massive, wow. like thing of top riders. There's probably a few I've forgotten, but it, it was it was a very very difficult um, difficult time because we've seen those riders go on to massive success, and um, so yeah, I was just lucky to be exposed to some of the best. Yeah, you name the like crop of riders there. It's pretty much the best of what we've had for the last, you know. A good good share of the best of the last twenty years here, eh? Really? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's 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 probably the, you know the pretty much the best that have gone on. You know, Stoner was a little bit younger, but he was at a few of the practice days, and yep. you know he was unbelievable at the age of twelve. Because you like at your age, uh, you just missed the two fifty proddy sort of era, hey? No, I got the back. I got the back two fifty proddy, but I wasn't actually that good. It was like in the changeover from RGV to Aprilia, so there was a mixture. The Aprilia yep. was probably a little bit better, but. I was okay at times on it, but I wasn't um, brilliant on it. But then as we got onto the bigger bikes, I got better and better and better. Yep. And um, yeah, just lucky enough that people seen something in me and, you know, probably at that time more in, than I seen in myself, I guess. As a as a frame, like if you look at yourself against the current crop of ASPK riders, yep. you're a bigger guy. Yep. You're a bit taller and stuff. We always a bit taller or broader across like you played rugby league you said were you always a bit bigger than some of the it's funny i was always like the wrong way around when i played rugby i was like rugby league i was small i was too, yep. too little and then um i had this growth spurt when i started riding motorbikes probably because i started stop maybe running so much and yep. doing stuff from that so and then um yeah i was like the bigger guy in road racing so that really suffered through those early categories mm. and then as i said when i got the bigger bikes a bit more power maybe a bit stronger yeah a bit more precise like yep. yeah suited my style yeah that's exactly what i was thinking i was like oh at Moriwaki 80s yeah. and then as you move up to like ZX6s and stuff probably really would have found a home at that point yeah yeah and like it's it developed actually bad habits being too big really on the on the small bike because I'd always try to like break so late and make up in the braking zone what you yep. lost in the thing and then it becomes a seesaw mm -hmm. so um yeah I remember the day that someone said to me hey just try this someone that you know Kevin, it was actually Kevin McGee he said oh just maybe just try break a little bit early not so hard and just roll through the corner and I remember being at Oran Park I was in a qualifying on the super bike in 2001 and the lap time just started tumbling down and down and down. Yeah, and I remember, yeah, I remember being fastest in the second qualifying, which set us up for, you know, a couple of awesome races. It's crazy to think because that's like the probably a dirt track head, isn't it, a little bit too? Because you did dirt track. Yeah. And just break as hard as you can and block pass and then worry about the rest afterwards. Yeah, yeah, the point and shoot mentality. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Whereas to get fast, 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 that's not the way to go, is it? Yeah, well, I've, I've managed to find the balance over recent. I can still yep. break quite, I can still, which is kind of good because I can still, I'm quite good on the brakes so I can make a pass. Yep. Um, but I know when I'm in a, on my own, I can still, you know, keep the rhythm going and make it flow. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, just different styles, I guess. What was the Kawasaki like at that time? Because that's what you got onto. Yeah, right? the, the Subai I rode was Kawasaki. So, yeah, I rode 50 Prodi Suzuki yep. and then 600 Suzuki. Yep. And then I uh, went to Kawasaki Subai. Oh, I mean... It was a ZX9, so um, at that time Suzuki had a G6R1000 and Yamaha had wow. their R1. I mean, but the guys that, you know, Robbie, actually Robbie Phillips was one person that put a massive amount of faith into me. And um, at that time, he, without him, you know, and he was so smooth on a motorbike and he could still ride quite good when yeah. I first started. So he used to ride with me a fair bit. And um, yeah, and that, the boys did an awesome job. So the crew chief I had at the time, was unbelievable. So he's in America now working. He worked for Yoshimura for years and right. stuff. And uh, he was really good. He's a Gold Coast guy. And um, yeah, unbelievable. I was just lucky that I, it's all timing and I had a good group of people around me. Who were those influences at that time? Like you look at MR, oh, not MRDDA, but Oceana Juniors or Ovali, like yourself now mentoring mm -hmm. people, right? Who were some of the people around the Moriwaki 80 time? Um, I get Bernie Hatton actually, because he's Tony's yeah. Tony's nephew, so from Top Rider, he was yeah. um, he was really good. He used to run our camps on school holidays as coaching and stuff, so that was really really good, like good fun. And he always he was always actually really fun to do that. Yeah. Um, and then as we got out of that part, I guess um, I was lucky enough. Um, Wayne Clark, who was you know him and Wayne Gardner won the Cash Roll Six Hour in yeah. 1982, which is how I ended up with my name. Funnily enough, Seriously? so yeah, my dad must have been having a few beers with his mates. He's like, "That's not a bad name." The boys won the race on Sunday, yeah. so That's we, we, well, he's uh, yeah. Well, I didn't have a name for a few days. Maybe he was waiting to see who won the race. Pretty much. I'm glad, I'm glad Murray Sale didn't win it because Murray wouldn't have been that good. A, <laughs> wouldn't have been that good a name. Imagine Murray Maxwell. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so now, nah, look, it's um, yeah. So yeah, look, it was um, pretty pretty cool. So um, 
Wayne Clark was a big influence. And then obviously, as I got to ride for over that time, I got to meet um, Robbie Phyllis, who was probably the biggest influence, you know what I mean? So Robbie's a, obviously a massive character in, uh, <laughs> in Superbike. So at that time, it, for me, it was hard to filter out the, um, the both sides of it, the, the stuff that was good for me and the stuff that was bad for me. Yep. But overall, like, you know, he made me a better motorbike rider. So that part of it, I can never thank him enough for. So this era, like you're talking uh, about 2002? Yeah. So, so you're 20. Yeah. So it's a time where you can get influenced pretty quick. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I was already, you know, yeah, I was already probably uh, a little bit, uh, you know, out of control and probably, you know, yeah. my young, my younger personality was probably not have the brain that I have now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, as I said, people back then are probably influenced either love or <laughs> love me or hate me. I think back then more hated me than love me. So were you a wild lad? Uh, yeah, I would say yep. so. I was pretty wild. Yep. So yeah, there was there was just times along the way that the decisions. Yeah, I was I was fairly wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I'm, I was I wouldn't say uh, I was either all in. I did everything with massive commitment. So whether it was <laughs> riding or off the track, it was uh, full commitment. Yep. Kawasaki is good times. Oh yeah, yeah. Busy young too. Good times. It was good times. Met so many good, yep. so many good people. Like you know, um, at that time I was. Um, in the road race team, Byron Draper, who's Owens, he yep. was in the working in the motocross team. He just moved down from North Queensland, and it was his first. You know, we're similar age. His first time away from. Oh, true. Yeah, so I've yep. known him for like since yeah, a long, long time. Yep. So that was pretty cool, and then to see what he did, and um, yeah, so met so many good people, like and um, yeah, so many people that you know, um, yeah, I have so much respect for now, and uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty special for me. Crazy to see, like obviously Brian's still in a team and and still working on heaps of different people's bikes and that along the way. My own. Um, crazy to see where some of those people are going that, around at that time too. Yeah. Yeah, like not only does Australia breed good riders, we mm. breed like you know good technicians. Yep. It's unbelievable, and um, I think it's become harder lately because of the regulations. Back in the early days when I was riding, then all the, the a lot of the regulations in the '90s were the same. So you yep. could. You know, you, like he's used to working on this bike or with these spec bikes, but now we sort of get looked at like, oh, he doesn't know about our spec bikes. So we, even the technicians as well as the riders, get overlooked. Is it overcomplicated now? Um, no, I wouldn't say it's overcomplicated. I, I'd say it's actually as a rider, it's you know, a lot of the older people go, oh, get rid of electronics, get rid of this. But as a rider, you've got you've got a million more things to think about now. Yeah. Like you got like, well, why is it? Why is it? You know, yeah, it might, might not slide. You don't have to work on the mechanical grip as much but you've still got to work on okay do i want traction control there or do i want the tire to spin in that part of the race do i want you know do i want the cut to be via the wheelie do i want like there's so many things Mm. to think about so your feedback has to be so precise and um yeah and so accurate and your riding has to be consistent because you can't just look at one you can't just look at your fast slap from qualifying you gotta look at a bunch of laps and take the averages because yeah sometimes you can just fluke getting it right but you can't fluke a whole race it's it's really fun. I was I was thinking about this morning before you got in here, and I, a lot of people just say, "Oh, it's good, a good electronics package on such and such a bike or something like that." And I was I was sort of sitting there, and I'm thinking, "Oh, yeah, that must be one thing." And with my job, I'm lucky enough to hang around pretty much everyone in the pits and get to hear many different things. And you know, I can take that part of wheelie out of that sort of section of the track with electronics and stuff. But you still got to have a good balance, don't you? Like a good setup. You can't just say, "Oh, well, we've got a good electronic package." It still needs to have a good technical person behind it. To get mechanical grip and stuff, don't you? Yeah, at the end of the day, like you can, ha- I can have grip, but yep. I-, I won't be going forward because electronics will slow the bike down too much. Mm. So you've still got to uh, find the balance between both and um, go from there. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, like it's a um, such like you said, you cop a lot of flack riding your caddy. The electronics are good, but the thing's got a lot of power to control. It spins the tire yep. very easy, and. Um, yeah, thankfully there's uh, was most of the time the last two years has been two other Ducatis on the grid, so it's um, I've been like, well, it's not that easy because those two guys can't do it. Yep. Have you ridden it without it? Yeah. Yeah. What, what's it like? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's yeah. all good. Yeah, I like the I like the power. Like I say at Phillip Island, we don't run a lot because you want the tire to sort of spin. So yeah. like, yeah, at my biggest charm at a place like Phillip Island is not enough power. I need more power. Really? Yeah, to go faster because I'm flat out everywhere. Far out. <laughs> that's <laughs> the only thing holding me back. More power. More power. Yeah. Far out. That's yeah. That's insane to think of because, yeah, that like times down there are pretty damn fast. What you got? Yeah, that's right. And that's like it'd be interesting uh, with more power to see if you could, you know, because you're still like 20k an hour down on a full factory superbike. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So and um, yeah. So with that bit extra power to get down to turn one far, out of turn 12 to turn one faster, and out of yep. turn two down the hill and. 
up out of there, up out of Siberia would be pretty cool. See what you could do. Is it still possible to do competitively a wild card ride in World Superbike, for instance? Or do you think because the the difference in bikes is too far? Uh, yeah, the difference is bikes a little bit. Yep. But um, my guys, Craig's got a World Superbike. We've built one. It's sitting there. Oh, really? Yeah, it's sitting there. Um, yeah, obviously we, you know, we thought about November this year, but we've got a little bit, you know, to do to expect me to do good in my ASBK races and the World Two Bike races. Yeah, is probably unrealistic. Um, it's probably disrespectful to my competitors in ASBK to think I can, you know, pay half the attention and yep. go just as good. And um, yeah, if we lost the championship by a small amount or something went wrong, you'd never forgive yourself. Mm. And um, so yeah, look, hopefully we can gear that up and um, yeah, we can push towards February in 2023. As a wild card. As a wild card. Yeah. yeah, that'd be cool. So it's a proper spec, spec bike. Yeah, it's close enough too. We don't want to change too much stuff, like yep. a little bit of stuff. We've got we've got a really good engine. Yeah. Um. Yeah. A little bit. Obviously, the fuel tank has to be bigger because it won't make the distance on fuel. Yep. Um. Different swing arm. Yeah. Different triple clamps for other stuff. You ridden it? No, I haven't ridden it. So it'd be nah. interesting to see what it actually. You know the feel yeah. of it to ride like. Yeah, hundred percent. I think Craig's ridden it around to make sure it runs properly and all the rest yep. of it. So yeah, we're still using some parts on our current ASBK bike. So yep. yeah, be pretty cool, exciting. Jumping into the mid 2000s, 2005s, and that, you're on the ZX10 for Kawasaki? Yeah. What was that like? Well, it was a really tough time, honestly, yeah. to, to be honest with you. Um, so, two, it probably started back in end of 2001. I um, had two options. I had a contract with Phil Tate and Racing. Wow. With PTR. They really yep. wanted me to come across there. And, um, and I had an option to go overseas and do some work for Patronus. So I, I took the option to go overseas, which was a really fun time off the track, but we didn't do anything really on track because the project was halted yep. in a number of reasons. So was this the foggy Patronus yeah, spice? Yep. Yeah, so we didn't really do too much there because we had a Malaysian connection that helped us out, finance our side of the um, deal, which was through Robbie, which, you know, if everything worked, per if everything had worked out, it would have been great. But again, politics and the way things work. But, and then 2003 came back, um, probably thought I was better than I really was. Um, had a pretty up and down year, not too not too bad. Had a few private backers to help me, but probably didn't understand racing or understand how it worked enough then. Yep. And then by the end of 2003, I had nothing. So 2004, didn't ride at all. So, um, and then, yeah, end of 2004, I got back on a bike. I didn't ride. That was probably the longest I've never ridden for. Yep. Got back on a bike and then that sort of set me up for 2005, which was a tough time. I'd moved from Sydney to Melbourne to be close to the team because it was a small team and yep. needed help. And then, yeah, and that's when I met someone else that was a, like obviously a massive influence in my career. Career was 2005. I met um, Stewie Winton who runs the Yamaha, you know, the YRD, him and his wife, yep. Janice. They were recently moved to Australia from overseas from Scotland. And um, yeah, so, and I lived with them and he's, you know, we got through 2005 and he said, okay, is this going to work? We need something needs to change, I'll get all the bikes and do all the prep and do all the stuff you need to focus on racing. And then through that time, I had some good other backers that were around and um, yeah, we got through 2006, we were really good. We got a, you know, a few podiums, front row and Tassie, like, you know, in that time you had, every manufacturer had two factory bikes. So to be yeah. in the five was, was yeah, hard huge. work, you know what I mean? Mm. And um, then 2007 went back to the factory Cowie team, um, which was a, honestly another, it was a real struggle to be honest. So. Um, you know, we went good, but not not great. And then, um, yeah, then that was the cow year. I mean, riding those bikes definitely, as I said, there's a there's a positive to take out of every situation. Yeah. And riding those bikes was definitely um, set me up because it made me ride outside my comfort zone, made yep. me do things, get a bike to work that shouldn't have probably worked, and um, yeah, set me up for the next coming years. Because like you, you look globally at that time, you're the only one that really got on in six that would have got really close to podiums and that. Because the six seven ZX ten wasn't, I think oh. Regis Laconi was on it, and they weren't yeah. really doing much. Yeah, Chris Walker, that. Regis Laconi. Chris Walker, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 So no, they weren't very good. Occasionally they'd go yeah. good. It was raining sideways and yeah. all the rest of it. But they were, yeah, they were a fair bit of a uh, a camel, and you yeah. know, it took Cowie obviously a long, long time to get out of that rut that were in. Yeah, yeah, it was huge. Like they built 04, first title back in twenty twelve or whatever. It's a long time. Yeah, yeah, for someone that had a. Pretty good world two bike history, you know. Yeah, they um they definitely struggled. Jumping into twenty two thousand eight, you jumped up with a freebie on the Honda. Yeah, or Moto Logic, I think. It was yeah, the time. yeah, yeah. Technic Honda. Technic Honda. Yeah, yeah. I just finished working at Pirelli at the start of that season. Yeah. Um, how was that? 
Yeah, it was um, I was a fantastic opportunity yeah. to be honest with you. So um, yeah, I came in. I, I I knew I had to get away from Kawasaki. Mm. I knew like I had a contract there, and they were offering like not enough, anywhere near enough money at the time to ride that motorbike. And I knew my value, yep. and that's one thing that I sort of always been able to understand. So I was like, I've got to get out of here. Um, freebie was, um, you know, I, he was probably unsure because you're riding a Kawasaki, you know, people are like, are they any good or they whatever? Yep. But I'd been, able to beat, I'd been able to beat my teammates, which was always good because they'd been good on other brands. Who did you have then? Was it Shannon, Shannon Johnson? Johnson yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, and he was like, yeah, he was a he was a really – I've always got along with my teammates really, really good. He was a yep. really good one. So, um, yeah, then so to come come out of um, in that era, it was um, unbelievable really. I struggled to be honest because the Honda probably was a lot – it worked. Yeah, right. And I, and Just I, a better bike. Yeah, and I yep. struggled with that part of it. And I'd gone from Dunlop back to Pirelli. Um, and I was just pretty much the only one on the 600 field on Pirelli, everyone else on Dunlop. Mm. So, yeah, basically four factory Yamahas on the grid, 600, Josh Waters yep. on a Suzuki, you know, privateer Yamahas that were really good. So um, there was a lot of up and downs. Freebie wanted to sort of pretty much get rid of me after the first little bit because I was struggling that, yep. that, that bad. And um, I was probably – Maybe it, I was probably looking back. I was probably a, like a handful or whatever. But then once we got the momentum going and um, bits and pieces, we were really good. I didn't uh, that year. I expected every race I went to, I expected to turn up and battle for wins. Yep. And we could do that. And um, yeah, it was an amazing. It was an amazing time to be able to ride that 600 as fast as I could at some of the circuits. Is um, it was pretty cool. It was an awesome setup bike. And who would you have replaced there? Would it have been? I know the year before was uh, Russell Holland and Brian Starring. Yeah, so they cut back the program to yep. – they were alarming and iron about the 600 thing, I think. Oh, really? Because obviously the Yamaha domination had been yep. unbelievable. Um, so they cut back to – they just focused their two riders on the Subikes. So they had um, Jason O'Halloran and Glenn on the Subikes. Yeah, right. Yep. And um, they obviously went on to win the title with Glenn in 08 and Jason was – you know, he was fast at, at certain times. He was He's obviously seen how fast he is now. He's a pretty yeah. good gun. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, then to see uh, – yeah, I was teammates with – uh, those guys, which that was, uh, we had the best time too, because you know they were teammate. Like I, didn't, I was no threat to them, and yep. they were no threat to my so situation. Good so good teammates, and um, we had heaps, heaps of fun. But um, yeah, look, it was really good. And then obviously, as I worked through that year, I geared up that I said, well, you know, if I'm going to be here, I want to ride that Subike bike next year. And um, yeah, once I got on, once I got on that, and yeah, for what not like for what looking back, I was probably way too demanding for for Paul not understanding the sacrifices that him and his family made yep. through racing. Like you, you think it's all roses and, you know, I want you know I want this or I want that, but you don't see what goes on in the background. And, you know, now that I'm closer to running, you know, pretty much the team with, you know, I run part of the team, I understand the budgets with Craig. Like I sort of look back at that and go, you know, I probably owe I probably owe freebie a beer to say sorry, mate. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. It's it, it must be hard because, like, you look at it now like you're with Craig and, you know, you're doing it overlay. Yeah. So you're running a business within motorcycling. It's not easy, is it? No, it's not easy. It's it's a it's a, it's a quite a challenge. There's there's always plenty of uh, hurdles to get over and bits and pieces. But um, you know, we we do it because we love it and we mm. can make a small living out of it. I mean, that's just a bonus. Yep. 2009, you got on the Superbike, eh? Yeah. How was that? Yeah, it was unbelievable. I got to. I remember at a Phillip Island a test. Jason was overseas doing some stuff in BSB already back then. Yep. And he wasn't there, so Glenn was there. Um, and I remember I got to ride the super bike at Phillip Island, and um, I just I'd gone fast in the first handful of laps on the 600 at Phillip Island, and then I high sided out MG. So they parked. They said oh, that's a waste of time. You're fast enough, and that parked that could do some laps on Jason's bike. Yep. And I remember like you know being in like a handful of laps, being in the low 33s, and I hadn't ridden a super bike for a long time. Wow. And um, I was yeah, and it was an unbelievable feeling, and just to um, yeah, just to be able to do that around there and then that just reminded just you know sort of showed that i was ready for the super bike and then that obviously set up for 2009 and yeah 2009 went to the first i had a hips uh what i have a shoulder surgery in the off season so i was a bit slow getting going yep. and i didn't do a lot of testing in the pre-season and um yeah went to the test at phillip island and um it was with world two bike they used to let us test there then yeah and um I remember they had all the times on the screen and there was there was me and then there was Max Biaggi and Ben Spees and so on. So to, to be faster than those guys, I think I did a 32-0 back yeah. then in 2009, which was uh, pretty cool. 
geez, that's yeah, that's insane. You, <laughs> you look at Ben Spees, he just come off the Moto America or AMA. Yeah. That was his first year in World Supers. Yeah. You got the title that year and you're fast then. Yeah, good. fast test. That, they were on Pirelli and the Pirelli development is just gaining a lot of momentum then. Yeah. And the Dunlop was probably, you know, back then. And now we've seen it sort of switch around with Pirelli's dominant. But um, st still, like, their bikes were really good and, you know, Max was on the factory of Pirelli and that was pretty cool. Yeah. And, and some big hitters there. Troy Horse's first year on the BM. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people coming into town for that week. So. Yeah, we tested with yeah, Ben W at Eastern Creek at a private test, just like not oh, long. Oh, really? Uh, no, so that was a year later. So yeah, a year later we did a private test for them in Sydney. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Were you, like, you look at uh, our era of person. Uh, did you get affected by the GFC much with riding? Yeah, a fair bit, yeah. yeah. Honda Honda had a massive cutback, obviously, and, you know, 2009 was a solid year. I, You know, I pretty much... Yeah, pretty much threw the title away in one corner at Phillip Island 2009, really. Wow. So, um, yeah, I crashed out of the lead. I'd been dominant in every practice and whatever. I had to just win both. There was 11, I think there was, uh, I don't know, nine points between the three of us or something like that. And, um, yeah, I just basically had to, I could have ridden around sort of one-handed and won and I was just that determined to just wipe the floor with them that I, there was a water across the track at turn 12 and uh, had a massive crash there and broke my... Um, yeah, broke my foot on one side, my leg on the other side, and um, that was the end of 2000 and, uh, 2009. That was it. And then, uh, yeah, then, you know, so after that time, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll have a contract, but, but no contract. Honda cut right back, massive, you know, massive, massive cutback. So um, you sort of left, you know, wondering what you're going to do. Was this around the time when Nicky Hayden was coming over and doing some stuff with Motologic or? whatever it was at the time. Do you, did you ever do a test with him? When no, was, no testing with them, no. Nah. No, no, none with Nicky, so. Because I heard I heard a thing from, from a friend saying that I think Paul had, had him over at that sort of time when he was still riding Honda GP. Yeah. And, um, yeah, but it might have been later or it might have been before. I'm not too sure. But, yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, gas Honda, year after. Yeah. You end up picking that up, eh? Yeah, it was good. Well, well Honda had could move some budgets around and do some stuff, but not enough to do it at the level that Motologic were doing it at. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, and Jeff Windsor had always built really good Hondas from there. And then, you know, so that's sort of, that's how that sort of partnered up. Tony Hinton from Honda did that. And that was a really fun year. You know, we had Richard Parry from Demolition Plus come on as an, you know, he was a massive motorcycling enthusiast, him and his wife, Ange, they yeah, supported us. And um, yeah, it was, it was really good, same deal. Just um, didn't, didn't quite get it right. Still hadn't worked out how to, how to win and how to make it work. And um, yeah, we fell a little bit, fell a little bit short. I think by six points or something like that. Damn. So um, you know, so that 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 started to, yeah, that hurt quite a bit because I was like, oh, I need to start winning. This is you know, this is not happening for me. Mm. So um, it was it was painful. So this is about eight years after your stint over over in uh, Petronas. Yeah. Did did the real of like you obviously yeah Josh Brooks would be talking about going over at that time. Yeah, he was, he'd already been over there for that there. long, and yeah, Josh, I speak to, I spoke to him yesterday. I speak to him most weeks. We're still close. Did you ever think? Did you want to go at that point? Um, or you pretty? It wasn't at the forefront of my mind because my yep. mind was if I wasn't good enough to win here, I'm just wasting my time going there. Fair enough. That's always been my thing. It's I've yep. always respected my rivals in Australia, and you know if I can't win on an underdone bike here. I'm not going to get the best bike when I go there. So how the hell am I going to win over there? Yep. Yeah, it's something. Something I said to, or someone on the weekend or something about uh, the the pride that's actually in winning an Australian Superbike Championship. You see people jaunting off around the world. It's like win them here because it's a huge thing to win. It's not a gift. You know, there should be pride in it. And obviously you do. And even saying about not doing the wild card for Phillip Island this year, respect to rivals. It's a huge thing. Yeah, it is 100. It's, it's it's hard to win. I mean, someone said to me once. Um, I said, well, what's the difference? And he said, well, it's no real, it's, the World Championship is no real different. You've basically just got um, one of you, if you're the best guy here from five other countries. Yeah. So he said, you just got to beat yourself, basically. So he said, like, you know, five of you in every other country, if you're the best guy in Australia. So he said, it's pretty hard. Were you a crasher growing up? Um, 50 50. I wouldn't say I was, <laughs> I was a massive crasher. So yep. I, I had, I would say I wasn't. Uh, a non-crasher. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things that's like, I, I'm just interested because like you look at the last years, last whatever, I can't even count them, but it's just consistent fast. There's not many mistakes creep through. Yeah. My perspective looking at it, but you probably criticise yourself as a human every day about a mistake, but it looks so consistent now. Yeah, I mean, in races, I, I was I was a bit like, 
Uh, Marquez. I would crash in practice. I would do that. But when it counted, I would sort of, you know, I knew that I had to not crash in the race. So, um, yeah, a bit like that. So I would probably crash a fair bit in testing or racing. But then in the races, I had a pretty good strike rate at finishing. Do you criticise yourself as a rider? Um, no, I, not really. I'm not over... No. Yeah, you know, I don't over criticize myself. I take responsibility for my actions for sure, um, but I move on pretty quick. I don't let it dwell and get over it. You know what I mean? It's all part of it. Now you got a family. Is it different? Um, yeah, it's a little bit different. There's a lot. Of, obviously, a lot of the focus um, goes away. A lot of the yeah, a lot of the focus goes away from racing because you got kids and stuff. And I, you know, that's a big commitment to make. So I love being there and hanging out with them. So the balance. Balance is a uh, difficult time. Time is the difficult part. Any mm. spare time you think you had, I don't have any spare time now. So, um, yeah, if I don't get up and sort of train early in the morning, I have to wait till nearly after dinner when they're going to bed to do any training. What is your training regime? Um, I try to train every day. Like I try to do something, whether I run or cycle or whatever. So being from Melbourne, the cycling thing's a bit slow over winter, so indoor a fair bit. Um, doing that and I still do strength and core try to punch out like three to five sessions of strength and core a week and you know um, try to do at least five cardio sessions and that's yep. about it I've got enough sort of experience to uh, yeah work it through when you, whenever you do retire I don't care if it's 60 70 years old or whatever you do retire um, are you going to be a trainer always <laughs> like are you, is that so ingrained in your body now that that's just who you are no not really I mean we all yeah, probably. I'd like to think I'm going to still train, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> yep. Also, if you rang me and said, hey, do you want to go for a beer this Arvo? I'd probably say, yeah, no worries, training can wait. I wouldn't say, no, I've got to go training first. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'd go for a beer and because um, they're, they're like, I've done enough training, spent enough lonely th of my own thoughts going through my head of why I'm doing this to uh, yep. I haven't spent a lot of time hanging out with mates, chewing the fat. That is that. That is a hard part. And you said like about being a wild one, sort of a bit growing up and that you probably still got to see some of your 21st, 18th and that of their mates, but you know, 39 years old now, you've probably missed a few things because of racing. Yeah, definitely. Like, and you've had to, you know, there's been events you go to and you want to have a good time with your mates or yep. um, it's funny now I'm so like, if you ask my wife, we're currently on a road. We've been away for a while we're on a road trip to the motorhome and um, yeah, she's like, you're so like, you're so relaxed. Like normally you'd be stressed about, you know, oh, we can't eat that. I can't do this. He goes, yeah, you've been so, you're so relaxed now and yeah. And I guess because, you know, because I eat a pie or I eat a bar of chocolate, oh, that's why I lost on Sunday. Like, I mean, it doesn't work like that. Was that ever a mentality? Well, a little bit. Like, you yeah. don't want to leave, you know, you don't want to leave any stone unturned and whatever, but there's also a balance. Mm. A happy rider's a fast rider, so eating a block of chocolate makes you happy. Eat a block of chocolate. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> um, 2010, so we, we went through that. 11s and 12s, you're still stuck with the, the Honda. For, for a bit, yeah? Yeah, I still was with yep. back, back. So, yeah, went away from the private Honda. Then, you know, Honda freebie went back to Motor Logic. That's right, yeah. And then, um, yeah, look, it was, um, yeah, it was tough times. Paul tried his, tried really hard to make the bikes better and stuff and had things out of his control. And again, 2011, I think four or five mechanical DNFs, mm. fair few pole positions, fair few race wins. And, um, yeah, started the year, I, was, I think I was leading the first race by, I don't know, four and a half seconds at Phillip Island and, uh, got a hole in the radiator or something random. Jeez. DNF the first year, first race of the year. Mate, the amount of times that I've DNF the first race of the year at Phillip Island, holy hell. Again, this year, I was like, that's a, I was just like, here we go again. Start again. Start again. This is a, this is like, uh, you yeah, know, happening again. So um, that was pretty frustrating. Um, yeah, then we went to 2012. So, yeah, 2012. I think we were short by four points, 2012. Yep. So pretty, another pretty tight one. Oh, you've had a few of those. Yeah, top three since uh, 2008. Wow. So always won races and been top three no matter what I've ridden. Led the championship at various points. But, um, yeah, it's been – yeah, that was the, the Honda era. So it was really, really good. And then, um, yeah, end of 12, I've got no ride. I've so wore, just dried up? I've, I've worn out my welcome with freebie, I'd say, if I've been <laughs> too hard or the clash of personalities, which is – the way it is, there's no grudges or doesn't mean he's a good person or I'm a I'm a bad person or you know any of those things. Um, it just it just wasn't working and um, you know we had Josh Hook there knocking down the door for whatever reason. Honda thought that was a better option. Yep, it's yeah, it's just the reality of life, isn't it? You see it in every every team over the years. There's someone comes through every time and yeah brings up different personality traits as well. Yeah, and definitely. And, and Jamie Stouffer was my teammate. So he had someone that was probably really relaxed. Yep. versus someone that was so hungry and to win that 
you know, you know, he was he was probably at a different point of his career maybe then to me. Yep. And um, yeah, it was so yeah, and, and um, yeah, so they they went with Jamie and Hooky and um, yeah, but yeah, Jamie was probably one of the one of the. He was a really good teammate. It was good fun. Good to be with Jamie. Oh yeah, we had these good times and yeah, it was unbelievable. That's cool. Twenty thirteen, you get back to Phil Tayton or to Phil Tayton for the first time. First time, yeah. yeah. You got the offer to do Phil Tayton, but yeah. didn't take it up. What was that like? Because you're working uh, with the industry giants over those years, you know, Paul Free the year before, go to Phil Tainton as teams, yeah. the two of the best at the time. Yeah. What was yeah. it like? Um, well, it was always funny because um, I remember for various times, Lynn, uh, Phil's wife would always have a chair in the garage with a hat and a shirt on it saying, it's there for you. Like, a, and this is like, you know, when I'm wow. the main rival in the championship versus Josh. Yep. I always giggle about it and, um, you know, got invited to Phil's birthday parties and those things. And I wasn't, I was the main rival. They probably wanted to hate and kill me at times. But, um, yeah, and then uh, I remember I remember Josh, I was out, he knew I was out of ride Josh and we were pretty close at the time. And a uh, water's that is for the riding for Suzuki. And he said, oh, you'll be all right, mate, don't worry. And um, I had no idea that he was going overseas. Mm. And uh, he said, you'll be all right. And then I uh, got the phone call from Phil and, um, yeah, went in to see him and, their biggest thing was they they said to me, we've won a million titles, we haven't won any, you deserve to win, we want you to win. And um, they did everything in their power to basically, you know, ensure that I could uh, win. Wow. What a big statement to make walking into a team straight away, eh? Yeah, and I was like, it was, I was so lucky. Like, they were so good to me. They changed my outlook on racing. They changed the way I thought. They, yeah, they were really good and, um, you know, didn't start off that well. I think I fell off the bike three times in the first four days. Wow. And uh, I said, this isn't working, Phil. We need to change something. And he, you know, to his credit. Now, and, uh, and it was only him. Warren Monson was my crew chief, which he was, uh, he was unbelievable. Yep. Um, you know, he was really good. I always had a great connection with him. And, um, yeah, it was – I remember the – you know, we were quite good at times. We struggled a little bit. Dunlop had some new ties and then they brought some other new ones in. And then once we got that momentum going, I remember – yeah, our first dominant weekend, which was in Sydney, to win, you know, win four races was it was a double round weekend. To win four races was yeah, I'll never forget that. That changed my life. Was that a good bike, the 2013? Unbelievable. Really? Ah, oh, unbelievable. So what I've about got it? it? I've got it at home. I Did still, you keep it? Yeah, the Suzuki gave me that bike. Yeah. That's a that's a cool memento. Yeah. So and and it just what it just turned, braked, power, just it just was a good thing. Yeah, it just worked for me. So you know, and Phil's. Phil and Warren, the way they developed the engine and stuff, the power was so smooth and so much of it and all the right places. Yeah. And, um, yeah, again, that year we got some upgrades as well and, like, they never, they just never stopped. They just wanted to get the bike better and better and better. And, um, yeah, it was a, it was sensational. I had the time of my life. Over the years, like, obviously, uh, two more super to- Superbike titles later, have you got to keep any of them? No, so um, Trevor Hedge has got my Honda from the following year that I won both F- FX titles on from 2014. I've seen that recently. Yeah, I know. He wants it. I need to. I, I don't. <laughs> I'm not so attached to the bike as in like the numbers and all the rest yep. of it. It's just having it there because when you look at it, the memories still come back, whether it's the right frame number or whatever. So mm. I do need to find one mm. um, of that and make it look and just park it next to the Suzuki. I've got my Morawaki 80 as well, my first road race bike. Yeah. yeah. Ah, cool. So, yeah. Yep. So, look, I've got a few good things along, a few good memories along the way. So, it's pretty cool. Duke? Craig said he'll build me one. Okay, cool. He'll give me one, yeah. Yeah, it's cool, cool to have those sort of mementos because there's so much work by a lot of people that goes into those memories. Oh, there is, yeah. and that's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I've seen Hedgie's one for sale, I think. Did you? I think. I think oh, it's that one. I might lowball him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got that, and, like, yeah, I was like, wow, it's actually not too bad a price either. Um, but, yeah, pretty cool machine. Yeah. So 2013, Australian Superbike champion. Good feeling? Yeah, unbelievable feeling, yeah. What what do you, what happens on that day? Like you obviously win it, you get home. Do you just sit by yourself and go, "Shit, I've finally done this." Oh, and normally that normally comes. Um, I won it in the first race. I, I passed. I think I passed Alan in the last lap. Philip Allen won it in the first. Won, I always wanted to win the race and win the title. I didn't have to. Yep. Won get the, it done. Won the race, and that and that time I the lap I did in qualifying. Everything it was just setting up for a good weekend. I'd been really really good, and um, yeah, to win the title, and um, we had one more race to go. And I wanted to go, I wanted to win that race as well. Um, but I, I didn't, the heavens opened up and it rained, so I didn't win that race. But um, yeah, it was a, It was just a, I sat in the truck and just just try to let it sink in. You think, I've finally, mm. I've finally, finally done it. I've set a year of PB lap times and, 
you know, it's been unbelievable. But it, it was kind of a, I felt like, a, like it was great feeling and stuff, but I felt kind of a little bit robbed because my good, the guy that had beaten me a number of times before Waters wasn't there. So for me, I was like, oh, well, I'm only one because he's not here. Right. So I was that, that, that part of it, you know, was whatever. And it was a bit of a bittersweet. Honda had sort of gotten, didn't want me, you know. I don't think they won a race that year at all. Yep. So to win, you know, to win all the races, like not all the races, but between Alan and myself and Robbie Bugden, I think won one or two. It was pretty cool. So I had to do that. And, um, but I knew there was, you know, there'd be more to come. Does the, like when that day happens, does the doors to Suzuki just open and there's just, you know, gold there and his, <laughs> what happens after like the week well, after you, did no, you get was, the boot <laughs> no it was all good well yeah. it was it was pretty funny actually because well, not funny at the time i remember getting a call from um yeah getting a call from uh phil saying yeah i was i was like where's my contract but i had the utmost trust and respect for phil and lynn that i was oh, whatever it'll come yeah they, they've been here for 25 years they ain't going anywhere and then um yeah suzuki are like we're out we're done we're, we're pulling the pin mm -hmm. that's it and um, yeah, so that was in January. So I had nothing. It was in January. Oh, geez. So, so January, gone through all Christmas. I had a good Christmas, relaxed. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Got got married in 2013, and, and um, yeah. Current super white champion. Yeah, everything. Married. It was an yep. awesome year. It was just I had the time of my life. My wife Brooke. It was we were having the best fun. Nothing was a drama. Yeah. Getting paid well. Yep. You know, easy as. Then all of a sudden, that no, happens. No job. Man, that's hard. No hey? job in January. Yep. Yeah. So happy New Year. So, and, and you've been on this a few times. You know, the Honda, Honda. It's happened those time that era. Yeah. Happened Suzuki, obviously later. So, see, so you went back to Honda though, didn't you? Yeah, I freebie, think. freebie. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Tony Hinton, freebie. The guys from Link International. Yeah. Like really, they sort of propped, they propped me up, yep. and um, yeah, and that that's um, you know, that was an unbel again another. It was uh, 2014 was a another year of highs. I had no obviously Suzuki had no um, position for Warren in the race team. Yep, he still was at PTR at the shop at Phil Tate Racing, so he came away to the races with me with Honda. So um, you know, for him, he'd never worked on anything but a Suzuki. Really, it was pretty wow. pretty weird. <laughs> and um, him to come across, and you know, we brought across our philosophy to Honda, which made the overall team good that year. Uh, Honda won. You know, it was there was four riders, so there was myself, Jamie, yep. um, Herfoss and Hookie. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and we won every race they're in. One of us four won it that year. Damn, it's pretty solid, isn't it? Oh, unbelievable! Like I think we filled out the podium number amount of times. We were first, second, third, and fourth. Um, you know, and it was pretty good because at that time we had the split between. You know, Yamaha were thinking they were going all right in life in FX, yes. which was a you know a, a really, as I've always seen it in a second rate series because I felt that we were the best riders in ASBK. Yep. And then to come across to FX and absolutely crush Yamaha's dominance, they didn't win a race. Maybe got one podium, I can't remember, but yeah, didn't win a race. And um, yeah, we 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 went faster than anyone had ever gone at all the tracks. Um, yeah, it was a, it was an amazing feeling for us at Honda, and um, yeah, another year of good times. Was that a messy year in the sport? Just with it, just seemed like there was just so much happening around. Then like the split FX a ASC. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a very messy time. Yeah. It, it wasn't good for the overall sport. Yep. At all, um, and all, all for the industry because they were divided between mm -hmm. it. Um, but then yeah, then after you know in that time, ASBK like uh, MA Motorcycle Australia had been working hard. And um, they started firing back up. If you look at it now, and we'll, we'll go back to that, if you look at it now, it seems in a pretty good place. Yeah, it's in a really good place. Yeah, I think like, you know, the the, the regulation's good. Yep. The competition's good. The costs are quite good. You know, like we spoke about on the way in, maybe the testing costs are out of control. They need to stop because that costs as much as going racing. So we just need to either race more or yep. do something about that. But um, yeah, overall, it's pretty cool. Do you think, um, like after riding forever, you know, do you think the Friday practice, if you have a good run at Friday practice, that's more than enough or do you really need to go for another test before? No, I think it's more than enough. I think like the rookies maybe because yeah, okay. yep. until we get that transition of the riders flowing through a bit mm -hmm. more, I think the rookies or someone that's out of the bottom 10, like someone that's not in the top 10 or top 8 or whatever they decide, yep. I think they need the opportunity to close the gap. Yep. But um, overall... No, I don't think that, like, you know, does Troy Herfoss need to do more laps around Morgan Park? Like, does Mike Jones need to do more laps around Morgan Park? No. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's definitely an interesting so, one. And then, yep. and then also I'm in the same boat as those guys, not to single them out. But, yeah, same deal. Like, do I need to do more laps at Phillip Island? Yep. Nah. Because you look at the money, like uh, two, two days we came up for three weeks ago here. Yeah. Uh, you had what, three people with you? Yeah. You know, all volunteering and that, but it's still people's time and there's still a lot of money. Travel. There's entries, travel, everything. Yeah. Uh, Spent mainly money on coffees, not tyres that day. We're watching the yeah, rain. Too. Lots of coffee that day. <laughs> <laughs> but that you look at you look at that. If everyone comes in on Friday morning with a level playing field, you don't need to do the test because you're all in the same boat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a hundred percent. So um, that's the that's the uh, go. But also, you know, the privateers aren't exposed to that time, so we need to try to get no, not the privateers. The, the rookies aren't exposed yeah. to that time, so they need to have a bit more track time. Like you get like Max Dalfer and that. Like obviously doing a good job where he's at, but just needs more time. Like. He does need more time. Yeah, and the way that some of the weather's been here, I think he said he did 25 laps yeah. between Darwin and Morgan Park. Like, that's not enough for a no. physically or um, mentally for a rookie. Absolutely. Uh, 14, you win the title with Honda. You stay with Honda for, no, you jump ship to the Yamaha. Yeah. The new Yamaha. At that time, obviously, there's a stint overseas for inju- uh, insurance. Yeah. Uh, on probably what I call the most beautiful looking motorcycle made. Yeah, yeah. Did you like it? Uh, it was a bit of a bust, but uh, it was a bit of a bust, and <laughs> yep. it was uh, again, it was it was good. I, I learned I learned a lot. Yeah, I learned where I sat in the pecking order of riders on because you're on the same bike. Because I got to ride with some, you know, Tommy Bridewell and some other guys overseas, so I knew sort of where I was at, my level of riding and the level in Australia. Yep, and um, yeah, it was a good time. Yeah, it looked like like for me that that bike was it was a pretty damn cool beautiful yeah. bike. You know, yeah. Uh, now jumping on the Yamaha, it was the first year of that model. Was that any good? Um, yeah, it was really like it was really good. Yep. So um, it took a lot because it was our first real year with understanding fly by wire. And to be honest, Yamaha was so so secretive. Really, in the first year, and, I, and again, I brought Warren. He came to Yamaha with me again, wow. so yep. that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, it was it was it was a good time and bits and pieces. And yeah, we just had a few races where we weren't quite good enough, maybe. And in the end, I think we lost by one point or something. So it was pretty tight. But um, yeah, we're still. Won a lot of races and had a good time. It was a nice bike to ride once you got set up. Yeah, when it worked, when the Yamaha R1 worked, it was it was beautiful. It, it, I it was an amazing bike to ride. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed that. In the end, the, my relationship with the Yamaha grew and grew and grew, and, and I enjoyed my time like there. And you know, they we've still we're still mates now. So to me, it must have been, uh, been right. yeah, it must have been alright. Jumping back to Phil Tayton, was what, why'd that happen? Why? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I always knew that Phil, Phil was really good, yep. and, and Lynn. You know, they were always really good, and we're close with them. Yeah. But um, yeah, they. I think Phil pushed really hard for me to be there. You know, there was there was other people at Suzuki that wanted other guys. Right. But um, Phil pushed really hard for me to be there. So my payback for him was win races. Feel good that bike. Yeah, loved it. Might, might bring it out to a historic race or something. We'd nearly be old enough now, wouldn't it? We'd nearly be able to... Oh, getting close. Yeah. yeah, one of the club rounds or something. Yeah. Do you keep that? Do you have that one? Yeah, i still got that one, yeah. The, yeah. the 2017? No, no, I don't know. I've only got 2013. Oh, 2013. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, okay. Yep. So yeah, jump back to Phil, sorry, after Yamaha. After yeah, Yemi, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yep. Uh, how did that come about? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Well, Breedy was running the team then. So Dale Breed, he was yep. running the team. Um, yeah, look, and then, yeah, obviously they'd had, they'd had a really good year in 17. They... You know, they won in 17 with Josh, yep. which was unexpected. Um, 18, they had a really bad year. Mm. Yama- and uh, Yamaha cut budget again. They're like, we don't have the money to pay you what we're paying you. Yep. And I try to manipulate it, say, get rid of all the other riders and staff and then just, you know, keep it the same. But they wanted to have two bikes on the grid. Yep. So, yeah, so that was, a, that was the case. So, um, yeah, I started hunting around and went over to Suzuki and said, well, yeah, you guys know how good I am, you know. Here we go. You need need to be on the bike, and then again from the first test, I was fast straight away. First handful of laps. Yep. I was um you know fast faster than Josh at the first on the first day on the handful of laps. Wow. And then um, went to the test. I broke my collarbone about ten days before. Got it plated. Went to the first test. Was fast yep. at the test at Phillip Island. Yep. And um, then yeah, obviously the year started off. We won the first race. Wagner took me out in the second one, and then yeah, I was injured in the third one. So whatever we finished, but yeah. We we set up a pretty good year and took the title fight right down to the right down to the end and um, again, yeah, fell short by whatever we did five or six points. Damn. And uh, yeah, but um, you know those the two DNFs got taken out twice that year. Once at Tail and Bend, 
once there and we lost the title by seven points. So I was like, well, I was the best guy here again. Yeah. We need to make it work. And here we are. Yeah. You're, you've been able to uh, win on bikes that globally haven't won a little bit. So yeah. 2013 G6R1000 did all right, but you won a title on it. Honda in 2014, you've won the title on it. What, you just got some sort of connection with those or what? Uh, no, I don't know. Just um, just be able to make it, I don't know. I just don't even look at I don't listen to any of the external noise. I say this bike's a heap of shit. It can't win anyway. I just work with what I got. Yep get the most out of it and um yeah and um that's the biggest thing i think i just work on the things i can control and yeah we we're, we're pretty lucky that i don't know it was just you know in this country we get away with it because of the regulation a bit more yeah yep. you know um yeah so the honda was a really good bike and a really good team suzuki was the same i think the team is what gets it and we get some mickey mouse style tracks here that you probably don't see in the world championship so yeah true yeah lucky to get away with it yeah, it's just interesting with that because, yeah, some of those you look at it and you think, I wonder wonder why, you know. But um, 14, were you on Pirelli or were you stuck with the Dunlop? No, it was a controlled tyre Dunlop, but Pirelli at the non, at the like uh, World Superbike and MotoGP. Yep. Yeah, I was interested because you said the modal support or the link yeah. support there. I was wondering how that all was going on. So Yeah. Now, going back to obviously two years at Suzuki, were they a good, good couple of years to be back in that house? Yeah, so it was it was a it was a two year deal at Suzuki. Yep. Um so it was yeah, nineteen twenty. I had a two year contract. Yep. And um yeah, so I was like, Oh, this is pretty good, two years, pretty good, went close in the first year. We we'd spoken about what we needed to do to improve in the second year and normally, you know, Phil sort of uh you know, he doesn't like losing twice. Yep. So he was um pretty eager to get it going. And then um again, I think it was December, I was away working yep. in two thousand nineteen, got the call said um, Suzuki have pulled out and I thought oh, at the time I had a two year contract I thought well they have to pay out my contract so I can go somewhere and take a little bit of a salary cut or use that to make it work for something so A my family's okay yep. got a bit of financial security Yeah, yep. and then in the end the small clause in the contract said if we don't race at all we don't have to pay you out really so they wanted to cut back initially to one bike yep. but then they would have to pay Josh his money yep. so then in the end it was all too much so they pulled out totally which was pretty sad um, you know they tried to make it work we tried to get some external sponsors but it was all too late you know just so disappointing because they know they don't just make the decision overnight they're looking at budgets from you know June yep. you know all the way through and um, yeah and to risk your life and fight and for those people just to say oh well it doesn't suit us or you know you'll be right how are you going to feed your family and they got no no you know the manufacturers don't give two shits about you personally. You try to kill yourself and do everything every weekend when you put your helmet on. That's the most disappointing part about the industry. It's that's that's what you know, there's no warning or you can't plan your life. You got you got two months to replace an income yeah. and that you've spent a lifetime working and put everything into. So that part of it for me, that's what I don't like about the racing and how the manufacturers, you know, a guy you know, I, I want a hundred grand to ride. Oh, that's extreme. You pay a guy sixty grand to drive around in a forklift Pick yeah. parts. Yeah. Pull yourself together. Like, you know, that's that's the annoying part. And, and you look at uh, risk, obviously one thing, but you look at the eyeballs that are drawn to it. I remember Chad Reed saying it once, like I've sold more bikes in like the South Pacific region than any of your ambassadors globally. Why wouldn't a manufacturer support me? Yeah. And it's exactly right. Like the eyeballs that you draw to it are more than most of the people that are in the tower making that decision. Yeah, and, uh, and that's a that's a frustrating part. And, yep. and you've got a small lifetime you know, I can't drive around the forklift till I'm 65. Yep. I've got to make, I've got to make, you know, a whole lot of lifetime and, you know, in a small time. Winning the titles, like you look at three, three Australian superbike titles plus the two in 2014 of what, ASC. Yeah. And there's an FX title yep. as well. Yeah. Can you make a living racing bikes here? Yeah, I th you can definitely yep. make a living. Yeah, I've been pretty lucky, but I've it's sort of the good thing about it is you can do other stuff as well. Right. So, um, yeah, you can do that. I think a lot of the support comes from your personal sponsors as well. I've been lucky to have a great network of personal sponsors that have stuck by me and supported me throughout the years. So that part of it's been pretty, pretty, like pretty lucky. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty good. But you can make a you can have a good life work life balance. Yep. And uh, make a living. So that's that's what I fear for the next generation. I hope they get to experience it. You know, the, the good times we've had. It's obviously slowly gotten worse. When yeah. I talk to guys that are older than me, they're like, oh, it was good. We used to get paid this or whatever. Yeah. So that part of it's um, getting worse, unfortunately. 
it is and without the support of outside industry like you know you look at the companies that are supported and without mentioning them they continually to support the riders here locally but just trying to find that outside industry is very hard yeah and you know, when so you talk about the championship before that's it's at that critical balancing point yep where it needs to take that next step but the investment that needs to be made to take that next step is um i'm not sure how they're going to do that well if you if you're in that tool seat in ma what would you do to make it better um currently it's difficult to say without knowing all the budgets and all the rest of how it works of course but i mean we need to we need to get the people like basically the way i see it is pretty basic i'd keep it pretty basic is that whenever i can go to a ride day i've always said it for a million years and i can walk around and not many people that ride motorbikes not all of them don't know who i am mm -hmm. that's a massive issue they're people who like motorbikes yeah. and they don't know who the supposed best rider in australia is yep. and they're at ride days riding around on sports bikes yep. so to me like you know you need to get the, that, that targeted audience first yep. and then move on to you know move on to trying to work out outside the industry there because like if you look at the the term everyone used low-hanging fruit they already like motorbikes yeah don't they yeah, not it's easy someone. One. yeah, yeah. that's an easy one you know yeah, they already 100%. like bikes so there's a good start there you talk of legacies and like people talk of legacies and that in sport like you're doing ovale here in australia you've got an event this weekend which we'll touch on um is that like i we my partner filmed a lot of stuff down on the podium and that the other day you're like the king of the kids at the moment there's a lot <laughs> of kids high-fiving you and everything as you come in does that feel like a bit of a legacy thing for you that you're leaving here as well as being a developer of it yeah definitely like i'm not old enough to remember being that young and looking up to Mm. riders thinking did that guy even notice me in the you know and they don't back then they probably didn't notice me or whatever so i spend a massive interest in knowing all their names meeting their parents yep. and doing all that and being an open book if you can ring me up and ask me a question about what you should do with your kid or do all that yep. um, or what you think's the best option i'll give you the honest answer sometimes it's probably not the one they want to hear yep. or whatever but um yeah look that's that's what i like about it and they're, and they're the future those kids are the future they can be they can be whatever they want to be, you know what I mean? And and there's so much talent. They've they've been doing it a lot of them from a young age, and there's so much talent. And I've got kids that are, as well. Yeah. You know, so I understand that more so maybe than I did earlier. But you know, they're all the ones with the posters at home on their walls. They're yeah. all the ones that you know wake up in the morning and probably look at look at a poster of me and think, you know, what influence you can have on their life. So I'm happy to give them any time of the day if they want it. And at the end of the day, no different to you. I like talking about motorbikes and they do as well. So that, that's all the same, same stuff. We're just different ages. But the Sunday afternoon, I think it was race two, like footage I've got, and there's just a hive of kids. Like, and, and we know what they race in at the track, but they're obviously going to be racing a lot of them this weekend with yeah. your event. Like, wow, that's it's working. You know, there's kids coming up, idolizing someone, and don't mean to try and make you, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever, but – yeah, they idolise you. They're like, yeah, it was pretty cool to see. And I was looking back at the footage through this week when I was doing some editing things for, things for work. I'm like, that's pretty cool. So yeah, and I, and I feel a sense of responsibility. Like, mm. I'm like, I can't say if there's a hole there, put your motorbike in it. So if, yep. I, if I don't do that on track, the monkeys, you know, yeah. do what I say, not what I do, do both. So, yeah. Tell me, and we, we, we're going, going pretty good for time, but we'll rush this through a bit too. But uh, the Ducati is... You're, you're there now. Did you ever think you'd be riding a Ducati? <laughs> no, not really. No, not at all. But um, how'd that come about? So I, that, it's back to the Suzuki thing. I was hearing whisper as I was cutting back. That's when I knew yep. I'd come back to one bike. But I sort of knew Suzuki's history. Mm. Walking through the back of the pits of Phillip Island, bumped into Craig's brother Dale, Big Dale, who right. runs a pit board. And um, I remember saying, you know, I'm not sure what's going on. What are you guys doing? I knew that Craig's bikes were always. He's he's the best Ducati guy. <laughs> In Australia, you can, you know, people can argue what they want, but he's a he's a gun, you know. And um, yeah, so and I knew his bikes were good. Craig and I used to race each other when we were, for years ago. Yeah, I always watched him and stuff, and always knew all his bikes were immaculate. And then I was working for Champions Ride Days, so yep. I was used, I was doing a lot of the Perth leg. And um, Craig used to come over with Fraser's then and do stuff. So we always get the red eye home. So after the day of Ride Days, we'd always go and have Nando's together. Yep hang out for a few hours while I wait for the red eye flight and you know we always got along good and stuff and you Scott and Nicole from Champions were close with Craig because they were from country town New South Wales similar hang out when they were younger right and so all that connection started to happen 
and then Craig, I seen Craig that had boost on the he'd had boost on his bike. I'm like, well, how can we leverage boost to try to you know get them a bit more involved and supportive? And um, so Lex, one or another guy we know that we're close with, you know, the guy from Jason from Boost, and then we sort of grew, and then we said, this is what we want to do. They a team like that needs someone that's got a reasonable reputation for sure, and someone that's got a reasonable following. And then yeah, just started like that. So basically, when Suzuki told me, I rang Craig, said, yeah, it's done. Um, I said, how much money do we need? I said, um, you know, I'll come ride the bike before I waste time. I might be hopeless on it. So I went to Wakefield Park, had a one last thing to do from Dale because he still had Canberra Motorcycle Centre at the time. Yep. At uh, Wakefield Park a day with his customers, which was always fun. And the next day there was a ride day. So yeah, I rolled out on the V4R and um, I think my 90, 19th lap was a 57.6 or something like that. Wow. And so, and it was going to be a pretty hot day, 35 degrees or something. So yeah, I think I was in the car by about 12.30 on the way home. Well, I was chasing money to make the deal work. All right. Yeah. <laughs> pretty pretty quick start to it, isn't it? Yeah, so that's it. They rolled the, basically rolled the bike out of how Jamie rode it at Eastern Creek. Yep. And um, yeah, I changed some gearing and a few things in the morning in the first full, few laps at Wakefield. And um, yeah, then I just was lucky and just I just got after a lap and it worked. And yeah, did it uh, feel good straight away? Different. Yeah, yeah different. But yep. I mean, the fact that it was different and I could go fast, I was like, right, we're on here. Yep. There's yep. something to work with. Yep. You look at, like, uh, in memory of, like, Craig McMartin riding, um, it's clinical. You know, really detailed. That's what his work's like too, isn't it? Yeah, unbelievable. The preparation yeah. of the bikes is, um, yeah, unbelievable. He prides himself on it. Yeah. He's like the, uh, yeah, he slit his, slit his throat like, a, you know, a Japanese warrior of it was, <laughs> you know, Harry Curry was no good. Loves Ducati's name. Oh, he doesn't know anything else. I reckon if you asked him to work on a Honda, he'd be lost. If you know good, he's just... He'd he's, yeah, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Uh, two yeah, two seasons of winning super white titles in a row. It's huge, eh? Yeah, it is. And, like, you know, obviously, um, you know, we've touched on it before, but we're not factory Ducati. We're not yep. factory Honda. We're not factory Yamaha. We're just a little old privateer team running out of Craig's garage from home. And, um, yeah... It just shows that when you've got the right group of people and people with all the same goals that you can, um, you know, that obviously has its advantages. You don't have the politics of the big manufacturers and all the stuff, but you also don't have the budget, so you've got to make every post a winner. Yep. Now, name, tell me a good day of motorsport you've had. <laughs> good day of motorsport. Yeah. Oh, I mean, um, I reckon the bend at the end of last year was pretty special. Like, Jack Jack was there. I yep. mean, you know, to be fair, our bike was better than Jack's. You know, that's no obvious, but he also is the, you know, was the fourth best motorcycle rider in the world last yeah. year. So, um, yeah, so for that, was pretty. that part was pretty special to be able to race him and to do what he's done for it, our sport. Just a, It was just a, like a perfect storm. Everyone had been locked in their houses for two years. Yep. We'd been opened up, so it was a massive event. Jack had come back and created all this um, hype. So to see all those people passionate motorbike fans it was like nearly being at a moto gp um the sort of the the positivity and the people have that they look forward to this one event um that part of it was pretty cool and to um yeah do it in the style we did it in and yeah it was um yeah i loved it favorite track um phillip island's definitely up there when you get a lap right right around that joint it's an unbelievable feeling so fast the bike's moving all the time it's um yeah it's unreal now, like, when you're when you're winning, like, what what does it feel like to win? Like, what do you, do you still just love it? <laughs> Not like, boring. It doesn't get you never get sick of it. Yeah. Ah, oh, it's addictive. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, it's addictive. So, but um, yeah, I guess you expect to win. And then when you don't, that's that's the hard one. That's the roller coaster you got to pick yourself up from. Yeah. Um, and, and and same in the team that I'm in. When we don't win, they look at me like, and I look at them like, this is shit, isn't it? This is mm-hmm. there's no future in this. Yeah. So um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it is addictive, but it's an, it's no other certain. It has different feelings, like the win the win on the weekend at Morgan Park, the style that we did it in the second race. Yep. Um, a lot different to the first. That's a you know that was a different thing. I had to take a different approach and to think on the fly and make it work. Yep. Is um that part of it was pretty cool, and to pass Mike into there is yeah, pretty cool. I was pretty amped after the race. I haven't been. I haven't I felt like that for a long, long time. Huge move. That's good. Yeah. That's good racing. That's yeah. that's what, as a fan, you just want to see that. That's everything. So do you miss the days of riding Supersport and Superbike on the same day? Um, no. 
No. Nah. No, nah, I don't think you'd be able to do it now. Too hard? I think the level's too high. Yeah, okay, yep. The level's too high, so it'd be interesting to see if anyone could do it. Yeah, I, it's one of those things I remember it happening and I, I just can't fathom how it did happen. Like looking at it now, like you look at an event like the weekend, I just don't see how it could work. No, yeah, and like I said before, I like to think it's a bit disrespectful to you yeah. competitors. It's like, you know, me only riding to like by the end, of, you know. We used to do double rounds then too. That's right. Double yeah. double rounds in both classes. That's right. So you used to have a practice quali- uh, qualifying Saturday morning, qualifying Sunday morning. No, I it? think we – no, so we start Thursday. We just start Thursday, practice Thursday, right. qualify Friday, then like the result from one maybe went to the other. I can't remember now. That's We'd right. have just – anyway, by the time you were – Winton two bikes double round, by the time you're coming around in the last two bike race, you're just like a blurry – it's like it's your out of your body experience. It's like you're you're wrecked. I think one of the cost things that has happened over the time is they did cut those days out. Yep. Remember, it was you used to rock up to the track like went bump in like on a Wednesday night. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's practice Thursday, Thursday, Friday. Like yeah. that's a lot of time to be out. Yeah, but office. sometimes if they got rid of testing altogether and just practiced Thursday afternoon. Yep. Like you still save a couple of days of travel for sure. Yeah. So that is yeah. an option. Cut the tests and do that instead. Yeah. Um, yeah, mate. Oh, Valley, talk about your event this weekend. I'll pump this out this Salvo so we can get some. Yeah, well. perfect. So the event this weekend is um, pretty exciting. Ipswich International Kart Track. It's a it's another you know one kilometer track. Great facility. Um, you know, round three of the FIM Mini GP. So um, pretty exciting. It's been pretty fiercely fought fought at the front. We've had a few different race winners. We've had rain each round, some of the races, and um, yeah, we got the you know Australia's best ten to fourteen year old kids. So um yeah, pretty exciting. Young Harry Watts is leading uh, leading the championship there, and Tieran Fleming and second. I think um, I can't remember who's run third. I think it's Levi Russo's in in third, and yeah, we got young Judd Playstead. He's from South Australia. He's only he's only uh, just turned uh, eleven, so he's pretty young. And yeah, it's pretty exciting for the future of racing. How'd you get into Ovale? So Am I was I saying it right too. Yeah, Ovale. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I was um. So Nick and Dim, who are my two partners, yep. Um, Nick was overseas, got getting married. Seen was somewhere near a racetrack. He'd been to Magello or somewhere. Seen these guys riding these bikes around on a cart track. He's like, that's pretty cool. And then got home, Facebook, seen this picture of Petrucci. He was riding one of the first Pramac ones. Wow. Right. And he's like, is that like a supersized picture? And you know, I started sending him a message. He still got the messages. We pull them out sometimes for a laugh. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, he yeah got into that, and then um, they started it, and they had a few bikes, but not being from the motorbike industry, but successful in other businesses, it's probably struggled to get traction. And then I was in an event once, and they asked me to come on, like come and have a ride, have a ride of the bike, and I was like, oh yeah, first like everyone, look at that little bike. I don't know about yep. that. Rode it, I was like, this is all right. This is got to be a credit. This 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 could actually work all right. This whole bike thing fell off it, I think, after a few laps or whatever, like I do. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then went from there. And then they like they also had a event business which was called Moto Tuesdays. They used to run it uh, like a high cart go kart track. Yep. And um, then after so during that time they'd been working on getting to a full size go kart track with a local club and bits and pieces. And um, yeah, so first batch of bikes, I said yeah, I'll take one and bits and pieces. Then after that they said oh well, do you want, we we need someone in our business that knows about motorbikes and whatever so. I got into the business with them. They were generous enough to have me in the business in the ride day part of it and the events part. Yep. And um, yeah, first bikes, I think we ordered 10. Next one, we ordered a container. We were shitting ourselves. Wow. I ordered a container, 28 bikes. They were all sold before they landed. Then Jeez. the next, and that just went on, and that just went on for the first two years, basically. Yep. And um, now we finally can hold stock and we've got stuff going on. Um, yeah, we've been successful enough to sell you know, a bunch of containers over the last few years and, um, yeah, it's going really, really well. So, um, you know, Dim and I basically spend most days working in the business now to grow it. Yeah. Um, you know, so the next part is, I guess, we want to grow to an academy, have an academy. You know, yeah. this year we're taking the top two from our championship to the world final in Spain, which is pretty special, 16 yeah. other countries. Yep. Get to race at uh, the last round of MotoGP at Valencia. So they're going to race on the Wednesday, Thursday. They get a mentor. You get every country gets a mentor. So Remy and Jack will be our mentors, and Joel yep. for Australia. Um, all the motor GP riders attend. You know, pretty special for the kids. Like absolutely. This year, take top three in the championship to Australian Grand Prix yep. to the press conference. They get to hang out there. Pretty cool as a ten to fourteen year old. Imagine it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's pretty cool. I thought I was a rock star. Those likes to kill, they're already ahead of me. Oh, mate, they are. They, <laughs> they're so, I don't know, you just look at them and they're just so polished, so good, you know? Yeah. Like, there's actual skills, really good skill sets, you know, even just off the bike as well. It's yeah. pretty special. Yeah, definitely. And that's, I think, I've been, as a round, all-rounded rider, yep. I've been lucky enough, as I said, to have a bunch of personal sponsors and stuff that have followed me mm. and to keep those sponsors and do that has been a difficult well, that's difficult to do have the same sponsors back to back and yep. do that so that's what I want to teach these kids because it's it's actually a business now it's not just being able to ride a motorbike fast yep. it's a business so that's what I want to help these kids and their families to to make it sustainable so they can have a good time I ride I've ridden mountain bikes with Harry Watts yeah killer yeah like it's it, like I, even still like 12 years old or whatever 14 years old it's it's so dedicated. It's awesome. Yeah, it is. It is. So, um, yeah, pretty uh, – I, I get excited by it, to yep. be honest with you. I get a massive kick out of it. Yep. And um, I can't wait to be able to – you know, we've seen how good Damien Cudlin's done with his Moto Stars thing. Sure. Damien and I are one day apart in age, rivals from kids racing. Yep. So, um, you know, we got a, I've got a huge respect for what he's done. And um, I hope, you know – you can't do – the thing is I've said to even Damien from the start is obviously everyone wants to be protective about their business, but I can't do everything, he can't do everything, but we can make a difference together. Mm. So hopefully that's the plan. Mate, that's awesome. Give us a uh, competitor. Who's the, who's the toughest competitor over the years? Oh, Herfoss has been unbelievable. Yep. Um, we've Without been, disrespecting people, but who's the – yeah. Turn, Herfoss turn. has been un- unbelievable, to be honest with you. Um, that's why it, it breaks my heart a little bit to see him, like, not, you know, fighting a little bit at the moment. Um, so yeah, he's been unbelievable to, to race against. Um, yeah, probably the hardest, hardest one, especially at the end of the race when you want to get the get the wood on him. It's it's difficult to do. Awesome, mate. Well, yeah, thanks for coming in. Thanks nah. for making this happen. It's um, you've taken your whole family up here today with this, <laughs> and yeah, they're, they're out here as well. So, mate, thank you. Nah, thanks for having me, mate. I've, uh, we've had it on the. We've been trying to do it for a while, so to finally get it done, and uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks, appreciate it, mate. That's all we have time for in today's show. If you get the chance, head over to YouTube and hit subscribe on the Talk and Chatter page. Also, head over to iTunes and give us a star rating and a review there. It all helps to get the podcast out there. A big thank you goes to everyone that's been doing this already, and uh, we'll be back with another show soon.